Um, and this is an event held by Collective Sweat Detroit. Um, you probably know that since you've made it here, but that's who we are. And I'm gonna take this moment to introduce our amazing panelists. And so um, when I say your name, will you guys just like do a wave so that we can see you all and that the audience can see you all. Cool. I'm just gonna scroll up so I can read your guys's beautiful bios. Cool. So I want to start by introducing Madame Penny Galboldo. Penny Galboldo is a practicing artist who has proudly called Detroit home all her life, even during those years when many had given up on our dynamic city. Travels as a researcher and practicing artist have taken her to countries in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, the Caribbean, and South America. She could not feel more blessed than to be in the midst of the artistic explosion in the Black Lives Matter movement and is committed to movement on these two fronts. So we welcome her today. Also want to welcome Dominic Mitchell. He has trained and studied at Wayne State University, receiving his bachelor's of science in dance, has trained and performed with many companies and artists nationally and internationally for over eight years. Some of these including Bakalama Dance of Senegal and Deeply Rooted Dance Company. His training is rooting in African diaspora dance, classical modern and contemporary movement approaches. And he is currently studying the philosophy, pedagogy and theories of Catherine Dunham and is in the process of receiving the Catherine Dunham teaching certification. He continues to establish a wholesome approach to dance education that emphasizes cross-cultural communication. He serves as a founding administrator and leader for Routied Enrichment Center in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which reclaims the village through community liberation by holding space for internal transformation, healing, cultural arts, and birthing justice. So welcome, Dominic. We also want to welcome Kari Lou Forshi, who was raised in Juarez, Mexico. She is an interdisciplinary artist who finds joy creating performances that blend experimental theater and music. She finds profound inspiration in her roots and the women in her family. She has been a Detroit-based performer and teaching artist since 2011 and is a member of the theater company, A Host of People, since 2013. Kari Lu currently works as a teaching artist for Living Arts Detroit, University Musical Society, and Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit, and recently became a Detroit Krasigi Arts Fellow. And then lastly, we want to welcome Claire Croft, who is a dance theorist and historian, historian and sometimes a dramaturge and curator. She is the author of Dancers as Diplomats, American Choreography and Culture Exchange, the editor and curator of the anthology and website Queer Dance, Meanings and Makings, and the producing curator of the Explode Queer Dance Festival. She is currently working on a book about dance critic and lesbian feminist activist, Jill Johnson. She is the founder and curator of Daring Dances, a program based in Southeastern Michigan that con considers how watching dance and making dance can lead us into necessary difficult conversations. Claire is associate professor of dance and American culture at the University of Michigan. So those are our wonderful folks joining us today. And I'm, I feel nervous introducing you all because you all, I like admire you guys so much. So thank you for letting me um, welcome you to this space. It's an honor. And I think I have a few last things. I just want to point to other collective sweat folks in the room. I'm Audrey. We also have here today, Teresa, Tree, if you want to wave, Maddie, Miriam, and Bree. And a note, Bree is our technical host. So if you have any questions, any needs related to tech otherwise, just use the chat. Chat function can be found at the bottom. It says chat, click on it. You choose Bree or host from the little drop down menu, as opposed to everyone. If you have a specific need, you just send that message. And then lastly, we encourage you to put whatever you would like to be called upon as your name for the Zoom. So you can click the three dots at the top of your camera to say rename, um, to put your name in, and then also your pronouns if you would like to as well. And then if you missed in the beginning, I also encourage you to have a journal nearby if that's something that you would like to have to write down, take any notes. And I think that's it for my spiel. I'm gonna pass it to Maddie. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, we're all so glad that you're here. This is very exciting. Um, I'm just going to go over the online space agreements. So uh, there were documents um, in the registration form that you should have read and received in the confirmation email. They were there and in the registration form. And we wanted to put them into the space today so that they're here with us as well. And if you'd like to refer to them in full at any time, Bree's gonna put a link in the chat. Um, so here I go. We enter the space with the intention to participate in this growing community with empathy, respect, and an openness to change. We agree to listen to our own bodies and be responsible for ourselves. We have full agency to choose to be on camera or not and to take care of ourselves as necessary. And if you know, take a moment away if you need to get water, go to the bathroom, recenter, anything. Um, as a dance community gathering, we hold the online discussion sacred as we do the studio space, and we agree to speak from our own bodies and experiences and use I statements when, when appropriate. Uh, we also agree to use content warnings if you share potentially sensitive subject matter. We also know that the online space is different from real life space. There are different stakes. Um, on the screen. And so with the utmost respect to everybody's privacy, we, the participants and facilitators, agree not to take photos, videos, recordings, or screenshots of any part of the event without explicit permission or consent of all participants and facilitators. That said, CSD, however, is recording this for community archival purposes, and so it will be available on our website. Um, if at any time you don't want something you say to be included in this public recording, you can let us know before or after you speak in the chat or just verbally. Um, you can also message Bree specifically, and you can also later email us at collectivesweatdetroit at gmail.com. Like tomorrow morning if you wake up and you're like, wait a second, I would not like my face on this, just email us and let us know. Um, you can also have your camera on or off at any time during the event. It's totally up to you. Um, we imagine that if this were to take place, if we were to gather in physical space, we would be in a circle all facing each other. So we encourage faces to like try to simulate you know, like community gathering um, effect. But again, totally up to you. Um, I lost my spot. Oh, if you'd like to stop or start your video, there's a little button on the bottom left corner that says stop video to stop it. And then it'll say start, to start it up again. And we also ask that if you are not speaking, please have your microphone muted to prevent any extra background noise. Uh, you mute or unmute yourself in the same area as the stop start video in the bottom left corner, and it just says mute, and you click it and unmute and click it. Um, and again, yep, just let Bree know if you have any problems or questions. And I'm going to pass it on to Miriam. Thank you. So, um, because this conversation can be one that uh, makes our, gives our bodies a little bit of a response back, we wanted to center this conversation, or start the conversation and center it with a body practice, with a breath practice, um, and using humming as a way to help our nervous systems regulate and settle. So uh, I'm gonna read some notes here, so don't mind me if you see my eyes doing this. So to quote Resma Menachem from my grandmother's hands, we need to enter collective action with settled bodies. Bringing a settled body into any situation encourages the bodies around you to settle as well. Um, so we're gonna start by closing our eyes, wherever you are sitting back. And I want you to really take note of how your body is feeling in this moment right now. Really paying attention to how deeply or not deeply your breath is. And now bringing your attention down to the center of your belly, behind your navel. If you want, you can bring your hands here to kind of feel deeper the rise and fall of your stomach. But even if your hands aren't there, you can still sense the rise and fall of your stomach. Allow your breath to deepen. Let it expand fully. Let it contract fully. And so from this point, we're gonna take three breaths together. You can continue breathing normally as you are, as I explained, but we'll take three breaths together. And on the exhale, we'll hum. 
And so it looks like you'll only be hearing me humming, but in other, in other circumstances, you would um, be, you'll use my voice and my hum to connect to my body and my body to yours. So taking a deep breath in, in out. Breathe again. Now. Last one, breathing in. And out. Continue to keep your eyes closed, paying attention to what shifted in your body in this moment, feeling the vibrations of my voice and yours. And when you're ready, blinking your eyes open to come back to your virtual self. Mm. Gets you in your bones in a good way. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Tree, and then she's gonna pass it back to me. Hi. So for this next part. Um, there are many of us in the room, and so in honor to try and keep time from escaping from us too much, we're going to do a chat check-in today. Um, so if you feel comfortable and you feel willing, um, we are just going to ask that you take a moment in the chat to just say a few things um, as like a little introduction. So we ask if you would like to say your name, your pronouns, and then where you are coming from today. Um, because that is something we notice that we have people from all over the place today. So I'm going to set one in here as an example. And Brie is also putting everything in there. But your name, your pronouns, and where you're coming from today. Um, if you just want to pop that in there, and we'll just kind of get to know each other a little bit, a little better through the chat. And then while you are taking the time to do that, I'm going to bop it back to Miriam, and she's going to just pose a simple question for us to all discuss. Hey, cool. To get us started, um, we want to acknowledge the folks that have been leaders, um, have been teachers, have been elders, have been truth tellers that helped us along the way as we started learning race, as we started learning what anti-racism was, as we started learning what um, decolonized work looks like. So if you have anybody that was um, this role for you, a truth teller, a leader, an elder, a teacher, an author um, that helped you along the way. We can just kind of popcorn out their names. And I'll start by saying two of which who are in the space with us, Penny Gobaldo and my mom, Vera Johnson, who helped me um, understand race. Uh, I can go next by saying that mine as well is Penny Gobaldo, who is in this space today, for being uh, one of my very first Black teachers ever. So thank you. Uh, I want to bring in my dear friend's name, uh, Ambika Reyna. Uh, I think she's so smart and I love her very much and she's very illuminating. And I just want to say her name, I'm Vika Reyna. She's my person. I'll chime in. Oh no, sorry, you go ahead, Audrey. I'll go after you. Okay. okay. I guess I'll lift into the space my dad. I'll lift in my grandmother. Honestly, I'll lift in my current therapist, who's like, it's really useful to have a therapist right now. And yeah, I'm sure I'll add in more in a little bit. Um, I was gonna say in terms of like my body and movement practice, Molly Shanahan has been very instrumental in um, 
decolonializing the space and understanding what that means in terms of movement. And Miriam, not to put you on my spot, but like being such a dear friend, like you've, you've been a really uh, big voice and inspiration for me. Thank you. I can name a couple more. Um, I can name a lot actually, but uh, a couple more that come to my mind that feel important are Dr. Melvin Peters. Um, Catherine Dunham, Techie. I'll leave those two. Mm. I'll say it the rock star, Adrian Marie Brown. Somebody I read. <laughs> rock star. Rock star. <laughs> I can I'm like, yeah, like if any anybody totally unmute and yeah. shout out your yeah, it can be casual, mm -hmm. can be a cacophony of sound as well. Mm -hmm. I'm a teacher and I'm cool with sitting in uncomfortable silence until I start to get a little bit more of a response. And I know that also, she's in the room who know exactly what the feeling is that I'm in right now. I'll go. Um, for me, it's bell hooks. Mm. Um, that um, when I think about race, it's always through women uh, and the matriarchy. For me, I look towards. Um, not black women as labor, but as the source of understanding blackness and uh, the levels of the um, experience of blackness. Um, I also turn to my really good friend, Darling, Darling Squire from Chicago. She is an artist and a dancer. Um, we, what I love about her is we do not agree. <laughs> and I think that is also, uh, is a good source of information is if you have folks that you don't agree with that you highly respect. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring uh, Darling into this space as well. Is this for anybody to chime in? Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right. So I'm going to um, call on my mom, who was the first black barber, buffalo, female barber, black. My grandmother who came up from the South in the Great Migration and vowed for reasons uh, mostly known to her, she would never return. And to Harriet Tubman, I draw a lot on Harriet Tubman. And I wanna give um, honor also to my uncle, Billy, who right now is the patriarch of our family and holds a lot of our family's stories. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Um, I, I'd like to bring to the space the strong women I come from. My grandmother, Andrea, my mother, Lourdes, um, and uh, my muses who are artists that are not here anymore, but brought um, transformed pain into magic. Um, Chabela Vargas, Violeta Parra, and Amparo Ochoa. I feel like we have space for like one more if anybody really wants to go and if not then we can move to the next session. I'd like to just bring the memory of my mother who died in 1987 um, clearing out my dad's house. I've come across a lot of archives and letters and documents and learned a lot about her that I didn't know.
because I was pretty young when she died. And she was a fierce, badass, adventurer, crazy woman. And now I know why I am like I am. I love that. Thank you all for bringing these people into the space with us. Um, it feels important to acknowledge the people who helped guide us along the way um, in understanding ourselves and our work. And so I, at this point, I think I will pass it on. Sorry, I'm looking for the next person. Maddie. <laughs> yes, it's me. I'm, I'm back. Um, feels like we're talking a lot and we have a lot to say. So the next part is more CSD talking and it is um, for a very important section that we're calling the importance of language. And so we just wanted to take a moment to ground all of us in some language and terms and ideas that may come up in the discussion that is going to happen um, of racism and anti-racist work in the arts community. So we recognize that everybody here today arrived here differently and from many experiences and perspectives and from different understandings. And so with that in mind, um, we CSD wanted to offer this next moment as a reference for everyone. And so that today we all know what we mean when we use some of these terms. Um, and so we wanted to have like a glossary sheet for everybody to look at, but with like the reality of how time moves, it, isn't done yet. So we're gonna send it to you all in an email really soon. And then you can reflect on it later. All right, so the first, now I'm going to pass it to Audrey to get us started. Yeah, um, the first concept that we wanted to just offer um, to enter from this, the same place from is the term black indigenous people of color sometimes heard as BIPOC, sometimes heard as BIPOC, um, and then also offer like where specificity arises in that. Um, so for this definition, I will say black folks, indigenous folks, and people of color, other people feel differently about how that word is said, but that's just how I'll say it right now. And when we say that, we are referencing the umbrella of folks who identify with one or multiple of those words. And BIPOC is not a substitute for specificity. So using the term BIPOC versus simply POC or simply people of color, we're acknowledging that not all folks of color have the same experience. Um, we can't be lumped into one kind of circle and black folks and indigenous folks also have and continue to experience oppression separately than uh, the people of color word. And then also we just want to say again, being specific when that is relevant. So when we mean black, we're going to say black. When we mean all BIPOC, black folks, indigenous folks, people of color, that's what we'll mean. And then we also want to acknowledge that there is a complexity into the, into any like umbrella terms and acknowledging where like folks proximity to whiteness when they are within people of uh, the the like phrase of people of color, which is so like strange to keep saying in like a, a, na a like singular noun when it's referring to a group of people. So I'm, I'm even feeling myself kind of jump in it. Um, but we just want to acknowledge the like complexity of folks who have fair skin tone like myself um, and how we sort of move within the spectrum of proximity to whiteness and like how we can continue to be specific when we're using terms. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's the BIPOC term. I'll pass it over to, I'm not sure who's going next. It's me. I think it's Manny. Cool. <laughs> pass it over to Manny. Uh, next up, we have anti-racist versus just not racist. They're different things. Um, so a brief note on what racist and racism mean. It's the marginalization and or oppression of people of color based on a socially constructed racial hierarchy that privileges white people. Um, so not racist, it just means that you're simply not holding the quality of racist actions, thought, beliefs, or speech. So racism is in, it's ingrained in many of the belief structures, institutions, education systems, notions of right and wrong, ideas of family, beliefs on career and professionalism, um, state-based routes to justice, beauty and body, body ideas, and, and more. And so in a lot of what is, and more in a lot of what is considered the Western world. Thus, even though one may not be actively racist, it's likely that if one is not actively anti-racist, they may at times be racist. 
And to be anti-racist means that you are engaged in an active way of seeing and being in the world in order to transform it. Because racism occurs at all levels and spheres of society and can function to produce and maintain exclusionary levels and spheres, uh, anti-racism education and activism is necessary in all aspects of society. So in other words, it does not happen exclusively in the workplace, in the classroom, or in selected aspects of our lives. It must happen everywhere. Um, and so like a little note, if though you may not intentionally do say or act in a way that is racist, you could still benefit from racist systems and white supremacy. Um, not racist implies passivity. And to be passively not racist is to be passive and complicit towards systems that oppress people of color. Anti-racist is active. It is seeing the machine and taking it apart. It is acknowledging privilege and actively redistributing power on every scale in institutions and in communities and interpersonally, et cetera. Uh, next, I pass it to Teresa. Unmute myself. Um, another term we'll be using a lot is uh, white supremacy, um, mostly in terms of art making, but just to break it down both generally and in forms of art. Um, White supremacy is a system that upholds whiteness as superior, and it is the belief that white people and white culture are inherently better or correct. Um, also that it's sort of the neutral or default, um, as opposed to the culture of people of color or predominantly black people and black culture. Um, white supremacy is the insidious and tangled bones of the state or the current US, um, and arguably most white-led institutions. Um, White supremacy holds and upholds power and value in whiteness and on a large scale manifests in institutions like academia, um, our prison complex, the government in general, gatekeeping in workspaces and so much more. Um, it shows up in major systems like museums, colleges, universities, the higher ed, um, performing art institutions, um, and dynamic art spaces like rehearsals, auditions, casting, all sorts of places, etc. Um, a few specific examples that we'll definitely get to today um, and we'll touch on in white supremacy is such like in higher ed, what are the techniques that um, are emphasized and deemed as important? Um, who are universities and places bringing in as guest choreographers? Who's in charge at these institutions um, and so on. And then one more term that we will discuss much more in depth later is professionalism. So just to touch on that, um, professionalism is the conduct, the aims, or the qualities that characterize or mark a professional person. And professionalism is very often overused in place of uh, subordination or conformity to whiteness. Um, moving on, I pass it to Bree. Hey y'all, I'm gonna be covering uh, equity. That's an important word, doing equity, not equality. Um, the uh, equity can be the state quality or ideally of being just impartial and fair. Uh, the concept of equity is synonymous with fairness and justice. To be achieved and sustained, equity needs to be a thoughtful, um, to be thoughtful of as a structural or systemic concept. Equity involves trying to understand and give people what they need to enjoy a full life and healthy life. I will be then passing it on to Miriam, I believe. Yeah, so I kind of have um, a combination of words, but I'm going to use uh, quotes to define them because I think that it's helpful. For mobilize, I'm using Kwame Ture's definition. Um, as Kwame Ture said, to be in, it, it'll explain itself. I won't try to. Kwame Ture said, to be an organizer, you must be a mobilizer, but being a mobilizer does not make you a good organizer. He also says, Mobilization mobilizes people around issues while we're concerned with the system. Um, the enemy will use mobilization to demobilize us. A characteristic of mobilization is temporary. It often leads to reform action. Um, organization is permanent and eternal. And if we're not careful, we'll allow mobilization to become events. The struggle is never an event, it's a process. A continual process. Um, so we will, as we send out this later, there's actually a YouTube link that will link you to the full video where you can see him talking about this, but those were a few things um, that he said that felt clear to me about the way he's 
thinking um, about mobilization. Uh, to continue on, I'm going to pull from Kimberly Richards, who is an organizer with People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which is an organization you should totally know. Um, and she was quoted as saying, an activist can be deactivated. Uh, if you are mobilized, you can be demobilized. If you are organized, there is focus, there is creation, there is a plan of action. The plan of action guides masses with or without the main organizer. As the definition for organized suggests, an organizer makes preparations and arrangements that move us toward freedom. So those are just a, a, a couple of like distinct people who A, are amazing, and B, um, just spoke in a way that felt really clear to me. I believe, oh, for example, um, in terms of organization and mobilization, uh, we see this in political elections, right? So people are going to mobilize around um, getting Trump out of office uh, and the new presidency, you know, we're gonna mobilize for sure around the election um, on the national scale. But how often are people mobilizing around elections on, their, on the local scale? It is happening, but people, there is a lot less involvement from the masses and the local scale as opposed to the national scale. So it's just a way to think about it. I believe I pass it to Teresa for activism. Okay. Yeah, you're correct. Um, just a few more terms. Uh, the next one is activism. It can be identified as a political activity that sets up short-term actions and statements for a variety of causes and social problems. Um, it moves from one issue to the next once there's been an expression of dissent voiced. It's based on an abstract opposition in principle rather than an attempt to obtain concrete concessions from the people in power, be they bosses, state officials, landlords, or etc. Activism is usually scattered politically, reactive, and unfocused. Activists are usually bonded not by common economic or social interests, by but by political or subcultural affinities. Activism also lacks long-term objectives for each struggle. And then I've got the last one, which is organize. Um, organizing will usually involve people from both outside and inside the base or the community that is facing, an, uh, facing oppression. And is contending with a concrete social or economic problem. Organizing has a clear long-term objective or objectives aimed at extracting gains for the base from bosses or owners or authorities or governments, the institution in power. Um, an effective anti-racist organizer, and this part is also from the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, um, an effective anti-racist organizer educates and allows themselves to be educated by the community, motivates, strategically agitates, provides human and technical assistance, and helps people get a sense of their power. So we can sort of like let this dense wall of terms and ideas um, enter through our brains, our skin, our wherever, however it enters you today, um, and move it with us into the next section of this evening, which I believe is going to be led by Miriam. Yeah, so I'm feeling the need to take a breath because that's a lot of information. <laughs> so um, if we can just take uh, a moment to take one deep inhalation in. in. So breathing in and out. and coming back whenever you are ready. Oof. So this is the moment you've all been waiting for, the moment where we start talking to the panelists. Um, but first, we want to acknowledge that this space is one of many conversations that are happening in communities all across the United States and abroad, and is in conversation with these other communities. Um, this space is also not a beginning. It is a continuation of anti-racist and liberation work that has happened through time and space for centuries. Um, but if it is a beginning for you, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, I also want to start by bringing uh, into the space the names of Jacob Blake, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, 
um, and Elijah McLean, uh, all of the people that came before them, all of the names that we don't know who are victims or survivors of police violence, um, especially because we are in the thick of it right now. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that the work that is happening on the ground and in protests intersects with the work that we are here to do today. So, um, I want to thank the panelists really quickly for being a part of this forum. Um, as all of us at CSD, as mentioned earlier, are admirers of your truth telling, of your art artistic work, and of your leadership in our community. So we thank you. Um, so, okay. Um, we want to start by asking the panelists the question of how can we release or share power to people of color, to indigenous folks, to Latinx folks, to Arab folks, and to black folks, specifically um, in this 70% black Detroit. So how, what does that look like um, to you? And we don't have like a, a way, so if you're ready to speak, just go ahead and speak in. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy and I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, I tend to always feel like a foreigner, like wherever I go. Um, to add a little more of, an, of information, I am an immigrant. I've been in the United States for 10, for 10 years in Michigan. Um, and my experience regarding your question is, directly connected to the children that I've worked with. And uh, through these years, my concern was more about the shame that grows with feeling like a stranger, with feeling like a foreigner. So how do you embrace yourself? How do you unveil the superpower if you're confused, if you don't have the, the information about who you are, about where you come from. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with a lot of, uh, mostly children from the Southwest community in Detroit, which are mostly Latin American. And uh, I saw the, the first word that comes to mind is omission. Omission of where they come from. Omission of, mm -hmm. of the, the characters that are important in their culture, a mission of, of their story. And that to me is heartbreaking. And I think that um, to start is acknowledging all of these like children and all of these stories and stop the thought that sometimes comes from so much kindness but the thought that you know what's best for mm -hmm. them. The thought that you know what they need to listen to, what they need to read, what they need to be focused on, um, the literature that they need to be exposed to. It has to come from them. It has to come from the community. But if there's no exposure because there's this shame, the, the embracing of that story is not going to happen and they're going to grow confused, uh, ashamed of their identity, feeling less than, which is a tremendous damage. Like I see it, like when I work with them. Um, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I've been in middle schools where they don't know who Frida Kahlo is. And I think to myself, you know, we are in Detroit. Why isn't there a unit focused on just on Diego Rivera? The power that he had, you know, the embracing, doing something with joy that gave him so much fame and success and work or whatever, you know, like there are figures they don't even know exist and they're living in the city, you know, like I started noticing a lot of that and it pained me because um, obviously I saw an omission, which I like to say because there's there's no information. Parents are afraid. Um, so they, they run away from their story too because they're undocumented, you know, like um, 
and they pass it on. Um, and I mean, I don't want to keep taking the space, but um, I would say that um, omission is a big one. And this, the, the, um, it has to come from the community, what, what is good for them. Um, so there, there needs to be a lot of listening um, of that. And just, I wanna just add one more thing about the lack of um, acknowledging the importance that, that this community comes with another language, which is Spanish, which they have to drop in order to be part of, which they need to leave behind in order, in order to feel worthy, which is just, I mean, I get goosebumps just to think about how children will introduce themselves to me with an American accent because they're afraid to say it in their, in their native tongue, you know, like, and I'm Mexican and, you know, and like to, for them, it's like, oh no, my name is um, Lupita, you know? And I'm like, your name is Lupita. I, I speak Spanish, that's your name. And you should be proud of it. But I just want to leave it at that. I don't want to take so much uh, space now, but I wanted to share that and start with that word omission. Thank you. Thank you. I'll speak next. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to thank you for this invitation today. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of this really important conversation uh, here in Detroit. Um, and I want to say, Miriam, that uh, I love the way you started with breath. And we have to remember to keep breathing throughout this. I personally could have used three breaths the second time. One wasn't enough. Um, but I want to remind people that this is a conversation that was brought together in love and hope of understanding. So try to keep breathing. That's kind of important to life, right? The breath of life. And those of you who know me, you know the Dunham technique. Um, starts and ends. We started into class with breathing. So that's very important for you to do, particularly as you become stressed, as we um, become stressed. I would like to second what Karilu has said, um, because the self-love is really very important. And that's one of the things that goes missing very early in a child's experience in this country. Um, and what I would add to what she said is that I think it's important to strive to always be authentic to um, how do we do that? I think we do that by continuing our cultural and spiritual practices uh, no matter what other influences come into our lives. Uh, our own voice is very important. And so we have to always be mindful that we are not following the crowd unless we share um, the same uh, values and principles. Um, I also want to say that I think it is crucial that we not allow death to become commonplace. Um, sometimes the more we see something visually on television, the more we become you know, somewhat immune to the reality of it. And so I just caution us that just because we're seeing a lot of deaths, that we don't get comfortable with that. Um, as far as power, um, I, I always like to say up front that those in power are the ones that need to release that power in order to share it um, with equity. Those who are not in power, what they must do is be relentless in requiring that that power be released. And that's a, um, a delicate balance. 
because we know that it's difficult for people to want to give up their power. Even if their intentions are good, it's still difficult for them to give up their power. So I think that we have to um, consider that people do things in love that are not necessarily valuable in our lives. And so I want to say that to people who are in power, as well as people who are seeking their fair share of power, that we do have to have the difficult conversations. And until we have the difficult conversations, um, not much other than rhetoric will change. Um, because we have to develop a thick skin, I think, to be able to talk about the things that need to be talked about. Um, we have a term in Dunham Technique, um, which I actually first learned from my mother uh, when I was a young child. And, uh, you know, that's self, self-evaluation. Um, and you have to be able to look at yourself uh, critically and be honest about what positive things you have in, in yourself, as well as, as things that maybe need change. Um, and I think we have to be critical while at the same time um, continuing to experience self-love. In other words, we have to separate ourselves from some of our behavior sometimes in order to look at it, break it down, and then decide what needs to be done for change. And I'll just leave it there for now. Thank you. I think I'm gonna go next. I'm gonna try to keep it short because I'm long-winded, <laughs> but... Um, the first thing I would like to say is I would like to bring Cornelius Frederick into the room. This child um, was killed at the hands of Lakeside um, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, we have in, in the state of Michigan, we have a child to um, prison pipeline that is ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's very unique to the state. If you look at other states and compare it to us, we are very harsh on our youth. Um, they are killing our children. I don't know how else to say it. Um, there's no way around it. Cornelius Frederick was suffocated by six staff members happening right here in Michigan. Um, and I am fully invested in redirecting some of our energy into our local um, events, our local officials, our local um, accountability. Uh, because what's, to reaffirm what Ms. Penny said, when you are constantly watching the news or national news, what can happen with a lot of people, I'm just gonna be frank, what can happen with a lot of people, especially white people, is you can start to distance yourself from the black people who are in your community and who have been suffering for generations. So you have to acknowledge the problems that are happening within yourself, within your family, within your community, before you can even start to worry about folks in a different community that have a whole different set of issues. Does that make sense? I just, I, I just don't know how to, I don't know if that was fully my thought process. I do wanna say that I am coming into the conversation with love and with a sense of unity and, and togetherness. Um, I start there. I am not someone who, I'm not going to be filtering myself though, I'm just warning everyone. Um, I think sometimes, <laughs> my voice starting to crack because I'm going there. I think sometimes I can be very harsh and unfiltered because I always have the assumption that folks are coming in with love and don't need to be reminded that. But I understand that some folks need to be reminded that although I'm speaking very unfiltered and bluntly and harshness and harshly, I am not someone who is anti-white. I am not someone who believes that, um, even though there will be a shift of power and that paradigm may shift. I'm not someone who believes in revenge. I believe that everyone can live in the world um, together and we have enough resources for everyone to live together on this, on this world. So I wanna start with that. Um, 
in terms of the question, how do we release the power to BIPOC? Um, I'm going to piggyback of, off of what everyone else has said. The mission is important. So there's kind of, when you're talking about Black organizers or Black people in the activi activism sphere, there's kind of two kind of arenas that I kind of like to talk about. I like to talk about the folks who are fully invested in supporting and uplifting um, the, the Black communities um, or the BIPOC communities. And then you also have the folks who are dismantlers, who like to dismantle and agitate the system, who like to, for lack of better words, deal with the people who, are, who have the power. There's folks that deal with the people who have the power, and there's folks that only focus on the community, and there's folks that do both. Um, for me, when I think of how to release the power, the next step uh, after the acknowledging that there is power is the atonement and accountability. So for me, it feels like in a lot of spaces, especially with dance, uh, there's not a lot of atonement and accountability with people. If there's no atonement or accountability in these white institutions or white spaces, um, in, in terms, when I say atonement and accountability, I mean the full spectrum, I mean a full audit of your institution from, from the moment someone registers for your dance class to the moment they're performing on your stage. We need a full audit of that process and how, how does a, a dancer interact with your institution um, and where, where are the measures to, to implement anti-racism within your institution. I'm a person that I am not a fluffy word person. <laughs> I like things to be written on paper. I like procedurals. I like things to be clearly defined and concrete because what folks like to do is they have beautiful meetings and have beautiful conversations and then their policies don't change. The, the way they structure the institutions don't, don't change. They don't have black leaders in place and they also don't have any sort of, for lack of better words, reparations or actual funding to black leaders and black people and people of color. Um, I, like, I like to talk in money because I'm a grant writer. So when I'm looking at money and the economic um, agency of black people, it requires money and funding. It doesn't, it doesn't require fluffy words sometimes. It requires tangible budget line items saying, as an organization, we're devoting X amount of dollars to black people because of X, Y, and Z. I just wanna say that as well. I wanna bring that to the table because sometimes what can happen is, especially as artists, we can get very lofty and very emotional and very abstract but sometimes we have to bring it back down to the nitty gritty. Where's the money going? Where are the resources going? Are we still using words like community outreach or, or, or are we in, uh, educated enough to understand that that wording should evolve to community engagement because of what, um, Car I'm sorry, I don't wanna mess up your name. Carlifu, Car 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 can you say your name? I'm sorry, I don't know. Kali, Kali Lu, what you mentioned about the the community already having the power and already having the the internal knowledge um, that needs to be activated and in your community that you're having your dance institution in that has to be activated. You cannot impose or advocate for those people. Those people have a voice. Those people have the talent. Those people have the knowledge. Those people have the capabilities. So what happens sometimes is we get super, super enamored and starstruck with folks that are not in that community. But what you will find is that you already have leaders in your community. You already have young people who can take up that administrative job in your, in your dance organization, who already has the knowledge and has the resources and networking in that community. But what sometimes happens is we, we go into a community with all these grand ideas with dance and we don't we don't acknowledge the power and the talent that's already there right so i want to bring that to the table um i don't want to keep speaking because i think that was enough uh yeah uh i i definitely like i want to reiterate what i just said the 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 money is important like i know the world is not a raw i'm not motivated by money but as a grant writer i see the budgets i do i do i go through almost all the major dance companies and especially the ones in michigan i look i look through their annual reports i see how they spend their money and there needs to be line items on all levels to 
to have initiatives for Black leaderships and, and, um, and some sort of programming that really empowers the community that that dance company or dance institution is working with. And that's all I have to say about that. Um, I obviously come to this question from a slightly different place as a white woman in dance, um, very much a guest in Detroit. So I don't want to pretend to know the scene, although I've been lucky to work with a lot of the faces I'm happy to be looking at right now. Um, I mean, in many ways, I would just sort of echo and amplify what's already been said. Um, Carlu's point about omission and sort of what, what cultural practices and knowledges and languages get to be in a room is a kind of power and a resource. Um, so always acknowledging who and what isn't in a room and, and why that might be the case. Um, many things you said, Penny, around, um, you know, I think this, this sort of understanding of push and pull and this release and the, like, I'm curious about how, as a person who does have a lot of power, I feel like I should be honest about that. Um, you know, I'm a tenured professor and a white woman. Um, like how to let oneself be open and to like acknowledge the power one has and to like just the, just thinking about the word release and that it sounds, it sounds easy to let go of power, but I know in myself, I feel like this summer in particular has been sort of another layer of my own growth and thinking about racism and, um, and anti-racism. And um, yeah, to figure out how to let that be a practice. I think something and particularly in my work as a curator, I've been thinking a lot about is um, that a mark of success might be that I'm no longer needed. Um, that perhaps I've been able to use my access to resources and the power I have to sort of, whether it be open a door or create a space that then I'm no longer the leader for. And that, that so to some degree, um, I think of myself, especially when I was doing the, the queer dance festival, like I, I was sort of trying to put um, something into action that I wasn't seeing. I was going to lots of places that were calling themselves queer and walking in and they were like super cis, super white and super masculine. And that wasn't what I understood the full possibility of queer to be. Um, but it's been really beautiful to do a couple years of those and, and A, to connect with people who were already doing that work and I just didn't know about it or you know feeling other people inspired to take on that work so i'm curious about as a white person making myself unnecessary um i'm also thinking about particular to dance um the degree of power that white women have and to think historically about that in a u.s context that we know that white women have been the largest beneficiaries of what's sometimes called affirmative action. And so how that creates this dynamic, um, I feel like, of white women sort of imagining they fought their way into something and but now potentially holding the same power they were fighting to get from white men. And that feels like something um, that's really important to name because I think sometimes the complexity of that is, uh, well, it's, it's not excusable at all, but sort of wondering how people you know, how, I guess part of what I'm naming is how quickly you go from, or as a white person, as a white woman, I can go from sort of imagining myself as marginalized relative to white men, but not understanding the ways I'm actually recreating a system that in some ways has also kept me out and continues to keep me out. So, um, 
Yeah, and that feels like a really big thing in dance in in every place, but um the role the role of that. And just to end on a maybe a slightly more hopeful note, you know, my own work is so inspired by learning queer history and sort of the possibilities of coalitional politics. Um, and so understanding how people from different lived experiences can come together and work together. And I have a lot of faith that's possible, but I also want to always be reminded that of how hard that is. Um, and, and also, I think as a white person to know that if I feel super comfortable in a coalitional space, there's a good chance that I am not releasing power and 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 not um, not truly showing up for coalitional work. I just kind of showed up to the party. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, I will first say that we know that it's getting close to eight o'clock, and so we kind of were prepared for us to go over. Um, and the panelists will stick around to have the conversation through to 830. So I'll just say that if you need to check out because you have things to do before then, you're totally welcome to do so. Um, but that we will likely be moving beyond eight o'clock because of the depth of this conversation. And I don't want to cut someone off in the middle of a really good thought. Um, but I will if I have to because time is a thing. Uh, for the next question, we're wondering how Black folks, Indigenous folks, Arab folks, and the Latinx community have navigated, create, and present work um, within what is already a white supremacist system, uh, and yet not compromise themselves and not compromise their work. Like, how are you presenting um, and yet, uh, and not pulling too hard on your story. That makes any sense. To clarify, when you say work, are you referring to artistic work or work in general? I'm gonna say both. Um, I think when we originally were writing, we were thinking about um, artistic work, but I think that opens up, like how do you uh, create, present, navigate, a white supremacist system and not compromise yourself. Um, I'll go first, because I've probably been around longer than most. Um, it's a part of this. I think that what Dominic said about money is so important because whenever I think of doing work, that I feel is coming from my authentic, authentic self um, and work that I think is true to those that I serve, I know immediately that there is going to be a dramatic financial burden, uh, either um, in terms of uh, what we will, um, we will, a performance will uh, render compared to what it costs, or that I will have to dip into my personal finances to be able to pay artists or to pay for space or publicity and, you know, just the whole list of what it takes for uh, a production, large or small. Uh, I also immediately know that I will be um, having a struggle with myself to not ask the supporting artists to compromise what they should be earning. Um, and it's really painful when supporting artists, meaning the dancers, the musicians, the technicians, um, those that do your PR, it's really painful when they can look and see that you need their assistance and they volunteer to do things that they should be getting paid for. Um, so that is a struggle. Um, however, it's so 
important that we not compromise what we feel we need to say, that artists um, do it all the time. And so what Dominic said about money, um, you know, it was a taboo word when I was a young artist. You didn't even ask how much you got paid. It was a labor of love. It was an understood sacrifice. Uh, and I am determined that that will never be the case with dancers and artists that I use now. I still don't feel that they're paid what they should be paid, but I believe that paying them is sometimes more important than me being paid. And I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but you know, let's, let's have these difficult conversations because um, particularly being a black artist in Detroit, um, it's not easy. And you're constantly making uh, choices about how often you can perform, how many rehearsals you can have um, for, for dancers who are, who are giving their time. And it's really very tragic when so there's so many funds out there. And then um, what else is important is that you not have to feel grateful to people who, who give you funds that you feel you should have. Um, so equity is a big one for me. And um, we need a lot more money pumped into the black artistic community. And the reason I continue to say black um, is because I don't think it's um, too much to say that when African Americans make progress, then they bring along with them many others. They bring along with them women, they bring along with them people from the LGBTQ community, and they bring in uh, other people of color. Um, I don't believe that's acknowledged enough, but I think that it's important uh, to say um, and I think it's important for people to understand that when we fight the black agenda, we um, are also talking about the agenda for uh, all people in the BIPOC. Uh, not that we want to speak for them, but we want to speak to their need for power as well. And I'll leave it there for now. I can go unless someone else has something to say or prepared to go. Okay, I'll go. Um, in terms of compromising, um, I'm going to speak from personal experience. Uh, I had to compromise a lot of myself to survive. Um, I would not have been able to go to college if it wasn't for <laughs> uh, a scout like scholarships and so many other things um so in terms of like the dynamic of survival in the context of dance yeah i did compromise a lot of my beliefs uh to keep white people comfortable um and and some black folks as well because it's a it's a very anti-black space in many um dance institutions um, especially when you start getting into ones that are in communities that aren't super diverse in a sense. Um, so my experience as the only black man in all three years at Wayne State University in the middle, in the middle of Detroit uh, has been a constant navigation of compromising my beliefs that were instilled to me and my family for generations um, and having to succumb to respectability politics 
And my definition of respectability politics is not <laughs> the definition you're going to find on Google. My definition of respectability politics is keep your head down, keep white people comfortable, and you'll be fine. And me navigating that as a dancer was extremely difficult because there was, there was moments where, you know, folks would say something and, so, and my gut would go, mm, that doesn't sound right. I should say something. But I knew that, that the politics of auditions and the politics of maintaining the peace and the love and the camaraderie forced me to put my belief system and my constitution to the background so I could expand my CV and expand my professional uh, footprint. And that's a sacrifice that so many folks have had to do, especially folks who are not as light as me, especially folks who do not come from a background of family who've instilled speaking proper or being able to use certain vernacular in certain spaces. I can't even imagine what that's like for my friends who are Black women. And for me, navigating that and also navigating other Black people imposing some of the oppressive language when I was reacting to blatant racism and blatant oppression and my personal experience, that trauma, I'm still having to undo that as I speak now. I'm still in a forgiveness process for so many people within my dance journey. And I will forgive certain folks in certain contexts. And that has been a process for me that I'm still uncovering as I'm going. Um, but now I am in a space where I feel that I have the economic freedom, to be quite frank, and the knowledge and the information and the ability to say how I feel unfiltered. And if people get more offended by what I have to say than the oppression, then, you know, I have to be able to just take that into account and just roll with it. Because ultimately, the things that I'm saying are sometimes the things other people want to say, but they can't for X, Y, and Z. And so for me, I am an, I am in an agitator activism space in terms of my local politics and what I'm doing. Um, I also have a decade of building a Black institution for Kalamazoo, Michigan. We just received a huge grant to build something. Um, but I am not in a space of compromise. I'm not in a space of, of using love, peace, and unity with no action underneath those words. I'm not in that space at all. So it's rubbing people different ways and they're feeling extremely uncomfortable. But I, I want to shift that uncomfortability into pedagogy and me working with white students and working with black students in that dynamic. It's, I make sure that my white students clearly and blatantly understand what it means to do black dance and be in, in community with black people. And so when they're uncomfortable, I have to give them the knowledge to transform that into action so they can be someone who can continue the, the legacy through the channels that they can, especially with dealing with other white folks, right? So what I'm teaching and I'm, I'm instilling these things, there is an uncomfortability, right, that happens and they have something in their gut and they feel, feel weird. And, you know, I just tell them, I'm like, you have to do the labor now. You know, I've given you the tools and the guidance but you have to take that and, and, and continue to the next stage. So yeah, so I, for going back to, I'm gonna wrap it up because someone gave me my heart, thank you. Um, the, going back to the question, how are we um, pre pre presenting our artistic work without compromising ourselves? Some, sometimes people have to. Sometimes people have to based on the, the marginalization. And so we have to kind of, you have to use your, you have to acknowledge that sometimes there's a privilege to not compromise. Um, and so, I don't know, it's always that, that dance that you have to do in navigating that. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you, Mariam. 
Um, I'd like to ju jump in um, and well acknowledge the what you both said about the economic struggle. Um, but also, I just want to add that my journey, it's been very interesting because I've been a performer here and a teaching artist and I started both at the same time when I moved here. And I went from compliance to taking risks. So when I first moved here, it was like, oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you for giving me this job. Um, I'll do, I'll, I'm, I was doing whatever they told me to do, you know, the different organizations and following you know, following directions uh, to work with my community, I was doing what I was told to do. And through the process, I'm like, wait a minute, what's happening right now? I'm not only like, com I'm, I'm, it's compl compliance and also I'm enabling something that is not um, um, working and it's not fair and it's not honest, you know? Um, so, to begin with, like, of course, I, I started like, um, in the performing aspect, I, you know, there wasn't space for me. There wasn't a, truly, I auditioned for, there weren't many parts. Like, I didn't look like what? Like, I didn't, um, the place, if we want to talk about theater and how there's not much space. So, yes, I did find you know, my, my artistic home, which is a host of people where I started, like I freed myself. And I, I think that a lot of who I am has to, it's, I, I have to thank them for, for those risks that I took. But regarding my teaching artist part, which is like, it's my performing, it's completely informed by that work with children. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm bringing the book and this book is the Kukui. And the Kukui is about this legend where this man, moms always tell children like if you don't behave the cuckoo is gonna come and get you and all of these things about death and like myths and like teachers were looking at me like what is going on you know like uh and the kids were like yeah my grandma my mom and blah 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 so i saw that in their face they were relating to what i was bringing to the classroom they were so i'm like oh so i'm just gonna keep doing this see what i'm gonna be told you know like so i start finding you know the books the, the characters, the um, bring it into this theater world to the classroom um, that included their stories, the myths, all of these things that might be seen as a negative part of the culture, you know. Um, so for me, it involved a lot of taking risks and taking steps towards being honest to my own story, my identity, um, and to what I wanted from, to what I wanted to see, like, uh, from the kids, you know, their joy and the, the embrace of feeling like acknowledged. And with my performances, um, one day it was just like a switch. For me, it, is, it was like this a so scary uh, moment when I did a performance that most of it was in Spanish. And I performed it in front of audiences who couldn't speak Spanish, the majority. And that was for me, like, it was so scary. But for me, like the word that I would take to answer this is like taking the risk after enabling and after compliance. And that opened a door and it freed me and it freed people around me. It freed the kids, you know, it freed like, even the people I worked for, they were like, oh, that works. Why don't you do it again? Or like, you know, and I was like, just that step towards that honesty. Um, with my own story and where I, what I understood of where I came from and the kids that I work, what I was working with. And I'm gonna close it there because I know we're running out of time. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if Claire, you wanted to say anything about that question, but if you don't feel the need, no, okay. So, Lastly, we want to address um, how white supremacy shows up as professionalism. Um, and so, I'm going to read through my notes. So, um, in ways that are easily recognized, it shows up as like requiring standard English over Ave or African American vernacular. Um, it shows up as penalizing traditionally black hairstyles. Uh, it shows up as ignoring and neglecting familial needs. 
and it shows up as valuing white um, and European names above all other cultural names in ways that are disguised. And I'm only going to read a few of these. There's a lot more. But for the sake of time, I'm going to read a couple. It shows up as perfectionism, um, meaning it's a tendency to identify what's wrong with little ability to name or appreciate what is real. Um, it shows up as a sense of urgency, making it difficult to take time to be inclusive, to encourage democratic or thoughtful decision making, to think in the long term um, and consider the consequences. Uh, it shows up as defensiveness, uh, a criticism of those in power is viewed as threatening or as inappropriate or rude. Um, also, for defensiveness, a lot of energy in the organization is spent to make sure that people's feelings aren't getting hurt uh, and working around defensive people. Um, and another example, I'm sorry, I have to say this one, is white people spending energy defending ag uh, charges against racism as opposed to uh, understanding how racism might actually be happening in their organization um, or in their actions. Uh, there's several more, but I'm not, I'm not going to spend the time to read them because I want to dive into the question. Um, so to our panelists, what are some strategies that you use to combat this kind of professionalism that is steeped in white supremacy as opposed to actual need? I'm going to respond, um, and I just have to laugh because, yes, all of that has happened to me many times over many years. Um, and as I get older, my response most often um, is to just say no. Uh, I'm not willing to jump through those hoops. And sometimes it means withdrawal. It means whatever you thought you were going to do, you can do it without me. Uh, because coming into something, uh, being invited to do something because others have preconceived notions about what it should look like is very insulting. Um, and sometimes the, the best thing you can do is just withdraw and say, no, no, thank you. Um, but I have to also say that it doesn't bother me nearly as much now as when I was younger uh, to be labeled an angry black woman. Because yes, sometimes I'm angry and I have good reason to be. And sometimes it's important for people to know that you are angry, you are upset, you won't compromise, and that rather than you moving the way they want you to in space, they're the ones that need to adjust. Um, and I'm just going to leave it there because I think for the most part that says everything. It doesn't mean that um, I don't find ways to uh, do what I need to do artistically. It may take longer or it may be pitched to a different audience than I would prefer. Um, but the kinds of compromises you're willing to make have to be compromises that you as an individual can live with. And for me, um, continually going back to who I am culturally, who I am spiritually, and how my body wants to move and respond to the world um, is at the top of the list of how I deal with just about everything. Thank you, and I'm just, I don't, I'm just gonna say that um, for sake of transparency, this is like me saying that to bring it to a close, 
Um, and that these answers will likely have to be much shorter because we still have like a couple of other things that we want to get to. But to I wanted to speak to this one because I, I think it's something I think about a lot as a teacher and professor. Um, because it's, I, it's actually really fascinating to me to talk with students, um, particularly graduate students um, who are kind of at a different place in their careers. Um, and how I see my role as naming some of like some sometimes I think prof this notion of professionalism is so insidious and like how to see all the small ways that professionalism is enacted um because sometimes I think it's easier to push back on the kind of obvious ones and so being in constant conversation with students and trying to get really transparent and clear about like you know, this is a moment you're being asked to compromise something. And then they actually like talk that through and like, what is it, what does it mean? What are the stakes of this compromise? Cause I do think sometimes we kind of, I, as someone who works in a large uni university and institution, there are times when I think something is super messed up, but I choose not to deal with it. I don't think it's a battle that's gonna be won in that moment. I think there's something more important. I have experienced what it feels like to throw myself against a wall and some days I just can't do it. And how to be in conversation with folks I mentor around like how to make those decisions while also, I mean, I do think naming exactly as you're doing in that list, Miriam, like naming these things is really important because sometimes they're so habituated practices. And, um, you know, as someone who grew up in very white balletic spaces, um, you know, it's a whole discipline around disciplining one's body. <laughs> um, and I mean disciplining in, in this moment in a bad way. And so trying to understand all the stuff that I kind of took on and just thought were the ways of doing that then become my habits, that then, um, you know, having to really talk through with students, those choices, I think are really, could, have been really powerful moments for me as a teacher. Um, and to also have people push back and say, no, this isn't a small thing, Claire, this is a big thing. And I've learned a lot from these conversations. So I, I was excited when I saw this question on the list because I feel like it's one that can uncover a lot of a lot of conversations that need to happen. If we are ready to move on to the next section, we can do so but I don't want to cut anybody off who has a thought or who may want to answer that. A small one? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Zavi. I'm going to keep it short because I'm long-winded. Okay, I have a bullet point. I'm going to list out what I do in the context of my pedagogy um, when working with students. My strategies to prevent professionalism is I allow students to express themselves in their full capacity that means I allow cursing in my class. <laughs> I'm talking about my class. I allow cursing in my class. I allow my students to get angry. I allow my students to have their moments. As long as they have a full commitment to themselves, the objectives and goals that they've established for themselves and we've established as a group. Because I think what sometimes working with my demographics of students is it for me it is possible to enact a sense of discipline while at the same time holding space for true expression in all capacity even if that expression is not always socially acceptable in the space outside of the dance class in my dance class um i say my dance class because i explain to them that this is not this is my <laughs> space but when you go to another teacher that can shift um and so yeah that's all i'm going to say about that because i don't want to keep going <clears throat> Hi, Lou, I saw that you were about to say something and I don't want to miss that moment. Yes, really quickly, I just wanted to add 
um, that it took me a long time to get to establish and get away from this um, by focusing on my mission. And this is how I resist. Because for me, every time I work with children, every time I remind myself and them that it is about the process. And what matters to me is that there, we inspire human connection and that that happens. The result, the, oh, you have a deadline, you have to do it this way and this rehearsal, so you have to have the script ready and no. You know, it's the process that matters and it is the, the human connection that happens through the process. And if that, and then you have to, that's what I can give you. That's what I offer you because I am committed to what my mission is as a teaching artist. And I just wanted to add that. Well, before we move on, I just really want to thank y'all for um, joining us for this conversation. Uh, I know that this is a lengthy one and we haven't even scratched the full surface of it for real. So it's likely that we will um, bring this back, this conversation specifically back again. Um, but now we're, I'm gonna pass it on and we're gonna do uh, another activity as a group. Thanks, Miriam. And thanks, thanks to all our panelists for like, I'm over here like writing down, writing down so much, so much of this wisdom. So, so excited to keep going for a little bit more. Um, so we wanted to open it up for a little bit of audience participant um, engagement for this end portion. And so before we do that, I want to offer one minute of free writing exercise. So if you have a pencil or like paper nearby you, or if you got your phone, you got your note function, something like that, um, I'm just gonna time and for one minute, we'll, in, we'll all together, we'll inhale and on the exhale, we'll write. And then we'll come back together at the end of a minute. Sound cool? Cool, so get your, get your tool you need and maybe just, if you want to like change your position of your body for a little bit, like find a shift. If you've been falling into one certain position, maybe find another one. Yeah. And then when you're ready, we'll take one breath in together. And as you exhale, you can write. And I'll call us back in at the end of one minute. All right, and finishing your thought, your breath, your phrase that you're on. And then when you're ready, we'll come back together. And I wanted to offer this moment to kind of jump back into our chat function and open up the space for everyone to just write in the chat some reflections that can be like short words, like sensations that we're feeling thoughts we're having, maybe a word that came up in your writing, a word that you wrote down that someone said that was poignant or powerful. And we'll take maybe two minutes to just fill the chat with these phrases or words that can be sensations, reflections, rememberings, inspirations. <clears throat> All 
And maybe I'll kind of read things out loud as they come in, if that sounds okay. Budget lines, outreach versus engagement. Take the risk, renewed. How have I been compliant? Mobilization, heavy. Atonement and accountability, omission, question. Embrace your superpower. Supporting, uplifting versus or with, dismantling the power. Knowing when to occupy a space. Full audit of these organizations, departments, yes. The actual practice of releasing power. Moving away from perfectionism. Purpose, holding space for both discipline and expression, refocusing at the local level, relentless in requiring power to be released, reallocation, restruction of power, and maybe a couple more moments if there's any last thoughts. We can also keep adding in the chat as we go on. Community outreach versus community engagement, forging a relationship to spirit, thinking globally, acting locally, it has to come from the community. Yes. Yeah, these are all such powerful reflections. I think we might have time for like one solid, doesn't have to be solid, but one full question and discussion from participants. So if you have a question that you would love to hear our panelists talk about, discuss, go into, maybe it's a follow-up or maybe it's something completely new. Um, you can write your name in the chat now. And do we wanna do that? Or do we wanna put the question in the chat? And do we wanna choose an exciting, an exciting question? I wanna make it de democratic and not have it be a competition of who can write their name the quickest. But also like, what is democracy? Like, where, where is that getting us now? So maybe there's another system. <laughs> I feel like Maybe it might be nice to hear from somebody. Here, yeah. To speak it. Great, that's great, Brie. Let's do that. How about you just unmute if, as you like? When you feel like you're called to speak, I welcome you to speak. There's also some new things in the chat that I'm going to say really quick before I do that. We have heal and unveil the superpower of your own story. Yes, that's a good thing to leave us on. So if you have a question, when you're ready. I welcome you to offer that to the group. I'm also comfortable being in the quiet moment too, so it's okay. I have a question. I think. Yeah, thank you. Jumping from that good. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the things that happened today. And I'm thinking a lot about the ecology of Southeast Michigan dance. Or let's say Michigan dance, Dominic, I don't want to exclude the west side of the state. Um, right. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, like, what is a first step? Like, in the classroom, in our performance? And I'm, maybe it's not like a, a monolithic way to approach that. But I'm just think I'm just curious if, like, if people if you enter into space, you're like, oh, I think the beginning looks something like this. I'm just wondering, like, approaches to, people's approaches to a first 
step, like an early step, the seed of a step. Um, it's good people's approaches. Well, a really quick answer uh, in terms of teaching practice. I think every single class that a teacher offers, there has to be a commitment to empower each student to be authentically who they are. And then everything else has to come out of that. Um, and teachers are in a very powerful position, um, and that position must not be abused, uh, but it must be used to acknowledge each student um, and to uh, encourage each student to, to give voice to who they really are. I mean, it's interesting to think about like your question poses first step as hasn't happened yet. Um, and just to, like as a visitor in Detroit and as someone who I should also say like, I'm an, I'm an audience member <laughs> um, is my favorite place in the theater. So, you know, kind of watching and witnessing being very central to how I live and um, you know, the existence of collective sweat, what y'all, many of you have been doing through the work with the gathering. I mean, I feel heartened in this moment, which is hard to come by the heartened moments, but um, I don't know that the number of collectives, whether they be sort of people naming their work as collective or trying just in general, trying to work in less hierarchical ways. I'm not sure we're at non-hierarchical but less hierarchical feels um, the heart of what the like artists are doing that really inspired me. Um, you know, I, I feel like so much of the organizing we've seen even in these last three months, um, uh, both less hierarchical, but um, I don't know, people being in a state of readiness to respond too and that's also i i kind of want to think about readiness as a very a thing that dancing lets us be in um so yeah i guess i'm just thinking about some of the steps i've seen and really appreciated and learned from and also that's a way to avoid having to figure out what's <laughs> next but i'll mute now <laughs> I just want to share a thought and whatever the, the art field is, um, working with kids and the experience I have with kids, this is something that has worked for me and is to listen, to see the child, what gives them joy. And if he shares that with you, and if you see it, nourish that. And that's, that's my thought. I'm going to be quick, try to be. Um, when I think about first step, I, I immediately think about who's first step, um, because I think everyone's role, like in relationship to dance, it matters, but at the same time, it doesn't. But in the context of this conversation, I do think it's relevant to think about where are you? Are you a teacher? Are you a leader? Were you self-elected a leader or just did someone elect you as a leader? Where, where are you standing in the context of anti-racism and your, you know, we live in a hierarchical society. So where is your positioning right now? So I think acknowledging your role and where you're standing is, is, is also part of it. Um, it's also acknowledging your strengths, figuring out, you know, I, I really want to help this situation that I see happening, but it, am I really good at it? Like, is it, is it something that I can be pr uh, proficient in and doing? Am I, um, is that my strength? Will I, will I, is that where I could 
flourish the most in that space or or do I flourish someone somewhere else? Because although you may see something crumbling in front of your eyes, you may not have the tools to to fix it, right? Um, thinking about, are you going to be someone who is steadfast or reactionary? Are you gonna react to the problems or have you been putting things in place up until this point that you're prepared, right? Because for lack of better words, the Black Lives Matter is trendy right now. It's a trend, right? This, we all know these, I'm assuming, we all know that these things have been happening for generations and generations, right? But it, it's, it's, I fully support anyone who wants to jump into the game at any point and do the work but also know that there have been folks who've been laying down foundations for so long and you kind of have to navigate those foundations and look at those conversations that have already been had before you hop into the game right and become um become a person who who wants to lay out your own foundations if that's something you desire or have the strengths to do also to choose your battles it goes back to the strengths decide what you're gonna th this kind of speaks to what claire was speaking upon upon um, her experiences as a professor, choosing what you're gonna engage with and what you're not. Just, just ultimately, you only have so many breaths in a day and just making that decision. And a quote my grandmother used to say is, sometimes in life, it's not about what decision you choose, it's just about making a decision, right? Because if you don't make a decision, the world will make the decision for you. So you may be in a mood of like, what do I do? What do I do? Sometimes it's just like, you need to do something, <laughs> right? We're dancers, we need to move into something, right? If you spend too much time not moving um, into, into education or, or, or learning about the problem that you're seeing, um, then uh, that's, that's, not, that's not active living. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. I actually want to make myself be concrete and say, um, I think listening to you, Dominic, I mean, I, I feel like there's something around like, I think we need to name organizations and structures that are broken and stop trying to like fix around the edges. I feel like, um, you know, I also do a lot of grant writing and I just feel like we really like the funding situation is super broken in the state of Michigan. The nonprofit structure is a white supremacist one that is, you know, really, I mean, this notion of compliance that we're talking about nonprofits just feel to me so much like a notion of compliance and also I think are terrible for young artists because they're actually impossible. Um, and I'm not saying they're great <laughs> later in one's career, but I think they're really impossible. And then on the flip side, there's something with individual funding that then is so isolating and I think gets in the way of these collective movements. Um, so, you know, I think we need, I mean, maybe it's a pipe dream, but I don't see solutions that don't involve more public funding. Um, and a public funding that that somehow gets away from this nonprofit or individual thing. Um, so that and my question in all of that is I'm not actually sure who <laughs> who is in the position to do that remixing of funding structures in the state of Michigan. Um, that that's a real question to me, like. I do feel like I'm someone with a fair amount of power and I don't know who, you know, so I'm like, it must be all the more difficult if you don't have access to white networks of power, institutional power to figure out how to change something. So something about restructuring and moving away from nonprofit versus individual and, and turning to a more public way feels really, really crucial. I just want to ask a question, actually. This is more so for people who are currently based in Detroit. There is, um, there is a cur current trend that I'm identifying, feel free to debate me on this, in terms of contemporary dance, where the, the shift is shifting to individual uh, funding for individual artists, right? 
In terms of the milieu of Detroit, like the current state of Detroit, what, this is, this is my perspective and opinion. I feel like collaboration is necessary. Um, do you feel like, for, I'm just gonna say it, I'm just gonna unfilter. Fighting for pennies as individuals just seems ineffective. In my opinion, in, in the current state of Detroit. Do you feel like there's a possibility for a true collaboration um, that is not only aesthetically pleasing, but also economically and sustainably feasible? That's for my Detroit people who are in Detroit or have worked in Detroit. I'm sorry, for my brain's sake, can you give that question to me one more time so that I can like properly digest and give a, a stronger response? Yeah, so <clears throat> I felt like it was, in my experience in dancing in Detroit, to me it felt very, um, I felt like I was trying to survive in terms of getting resources and money and supporting folks and getting money as a small, like, sectioned dance community that seemed really ineffective, especially with the whole competitive nature and capitalistic nature of pinning artists against each other in a way to fight for these grants. And I feel that it would be more powerful to do what Collective Sweat is doing in, in, in a sense. And what I, what I mean by that is instead of individuals or section off communities in Detroit fighting for the little to no resources that all artists receive, what is there some validity in the idea of more collaboration is necessary to, to really create stronger, for lack of better words, institutions versus the smaller projects or sectioned off uh, communities or individuals? Is that a possibility? And is that something um, that is not, like I said, not just aesthetically pleasing to see the collaboration in one performance, but also in a sustainability and economic standpoint as well? I'm so long-winded. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm working on it. I wonder if we could use, so we have this planned activity to go into a little whiteboard moment next. And I wonder if we could at, like answer this question, Dominic, that you're posing in that format. How would that feel? Yeah, let's do that. Maybe I'll pass it to a tree. Yeah, so this is an activity we've done our last two forums. Um, Brie is going to share her screen with us and cr it's going to create a big open whiteboard. Um, and so hopefully everyone is seeing Brie's screen. So if you go to the top where the green bar says that we're oop. <laughs> coming back, coming back. If you go to the top where it says you're viewing Brie's screen, you click on view options. And in the drop, drop box, you can click annotate. And then a little toolbar pops up. Um, so I'm gonna, Dominic, if you don't mind, if you could either with the text tool or um, by drawing, could you maybe in a few words, write out the question that you have um, somewhere in like the center of this, maybe in just like a few concise words. Uh, I'm not finding the text tool. Could I possibly type it in the chat? Sure. Just, if I, just to make sure, okay. Yeah, I can't we, annotate from the chat. Thank you, Audrey. So the question will appear on the whiteboard, and then um, we just ask everybody if you would like to participate. You can go through all the different tools. Um, there are stamps. You can draw pictures. You can write words, and just sort of we're going to create this little piece of whiteboard art together. Um, and if you follow us on social media, you've seen this from the last few weeks. We always post it. Um, and then we asked folks who maybe couldn't join us in this conversation to continue the conversation um, with comments and structure. But as soon as we get 
the question up here, if you can stay with us, um, we'll just, we'll draw, we'll create some art and have some fun for a few, a few short minutes and make something cool out here. There it is. Ooh, I typed it. I don't know if Thank I like you. it. I just threw it up there. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> okay, it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> if you've made it this far past eight o'clock with us, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and mm -hmm. let's just take a few moments to make some art. Ah, too big. Dominic, I don't know if you're on your phone, but I think if you're on your phone, if you tap the screen, there should be like a little editing pencil and you might still be able to get some language on here um, to answer the question also, if you want. Not totally for sure about that, but I've seen it pop up when I was on my phone once. Okay, I think I figured it out. Is that is that cool that what's going on now, Miriam? Uh, I don't know if it's, it's um what's the word I'm looking for? We can't tell who's writing what. <laughs> so um I think it's cool. Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay. Is this yeah. you Abby? Then yeah. That's me, sorry. Okay, well. Mm -hmm. The graphic designer is coming out. Sorry. But yes, also good to note that everything is anonymous on here. It, nobody knows what's who's typing what. So if that helps anybody with their comments, take a few moments here to just draw. Mm. I'm happy to start reading some of what folks are writing. And we can kind of like hear it be a sound and also see um, some of the things folks are writing. Zoom accountability meetup, discussion, self, community education. Sounds interesting. I don't have the resources yet. With shared responsibility. I want to acknowledge that this is something the gathering has been doing to some extent, reallocating funds to black artists in the collective. I'm not sure, okay, cool, I read it right. Shared exchange events, stop celebrating cutthroat competition. Resource gathering is collaborative. Shared leadership and rotating leadership. On the side, listening, witnessing, working, moving towards anti-capitalist and responsive organization structures, heart, we, work across disciplines, listening, openness, listening, literally sharing resources with each other, communication, 
eroding hierarchies. I like that. Heart, love. <laughs> Collaboration is power. Common good versus ego, heal. More funding would eliminate the competitive nature. Collaborations can benefit all. Yes. The need to do everything yourself, releasing the need for things to be about you, for things to be perfect. Cool. These, these are some good, some good strategies. Last few, more funding would eliminate the competitive nature. Collabor oh, collaborations can benefit all. Artists inspire one another, would take us to another level. Release, black space. I'm gonna pass it back over to Tree, because I think I've read. Yeah. Maybe just one really quick moment if anybody has any last minute things to add and then we're going to go ahead and save it and we'll it's come saved and i'm going to jump out right now just so everyone awesome awesome thank you for um participating in that exercise and again hanging out this far uh past eight o'clock um we're going to do a quick a uh, breath moment with Miriam and then some closing announcements and we will call it a night. It has been a full night. Um, we're going to check out with the same practice that we checked in with. So um, wherever you are, finding your eyes closed and we'll take breaths and hum together. Resettling our nervous system helping it to regulate. Again, taking note of how your body is feeling. Focus your attention on the center of your belly behind your navel. You can bring your hands there if you choose, feeling your body expand and contract. Allow your breath to deepen. And just as we did at the beginning, we're going to inhale together and exhale and hum. So inhaling, exhale. Mm. Inhaling, exhale, mm. and last one, inhaling, exhale. Mm. Taking note of how your body has shifted since the beginning of this conversation. Thinking about whatever your next steps are in your practice and your teaching and your organizing. And whenever you're ready, blinking your eyes open or coming back to a soft gaze and eventually your virtual self. And I pass it back for the closest to tree. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all. As said before, we hope to have many more conversations like this in the future. But thank you for joining us tonight. A huge thank you to our panelists.
Penny Gobaldo, Dominic Mitchell, Kari Lu Forshi, and Claire Croft for being here tonight and sharing uh, such wonderful things, such wisdom. Um, shortly, and uh, maybe not tonight, since we went so far past our time, but in the next day or two, you should receive from us, everybody, a feedback survey. Um, if you have the time and you wish to fill it out, everything on there is anonymous and all the questions are optional. So you can pass questions, fill out what you want, but you'll receive that hopefully in the next few days. It helps Collective Sweat with future forums as well as um, information for grants that we apply for. So we appreciate uh, if you have the time for that. You'll also receive the language glossary that we talked about way back in the beginning. We'll finalize that, make it look really nice, and we will also email that out to everybody that was with us today. Um, as always, these forums will remain free and accessible to all, um, but Collective Sweat Detroit is an organization that needs funding, like everyone, and we are currently still in a match fund grant um, situation with the Night Arts Foundation. Um, so if you have it in you and would like to donate to Collective Sweat Detroit, um, Bree is dropping that information in the chat right now on ways that you can do so. And we appreciate anything that you have um, and also, uh, September, um, Collective Sweat Detroit is going to be pretty light in September. Um, we're going to give ourselves and everyone a little bit of time, but, you know, keep in touch with us. We'll have, you know, social media announcements, maybe a newsletter, um, and all of our forums from the last few weeks, um, have been recorded. We will edit them the ways we need to, and we are going to post them on our website. So if you would like to revisit any conversation or if you missed one, um, if you know anybody that should have been here and would have liked to have, have heard things, um, they will soon in September be on our website and anybody can revisit them and see them and watch them. So thank you, thank you for being here. Um, we just take this last moment, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and just say hello, say goodbye. Um, and again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you all, thank you. Collective Sweat Detroit, this was an amazing gathering. Thank, Thank you. you so much for organizing it. Goodbye to everyone. Love you all. <laughs> Love you.